Trakita Jaquita Scott was born in 1989 and described as hardworking, loving, and caring and went by Kita. At the age of 24, she had a one-year-old son and three-year-old daughter, was engaged to her fiancé and working two jobs. She lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida and worked for the U-Haul company and as a caregiver for mentally disabled adults and dreamed of becoming a police officer. Her ex-boyfriend and father of one of her children, Carl Monty Watts Jr., had been very abusive to her and he has a long string of crimes against other women. But the two had a child together and therefore she had to interact with him at times. One of her employers, Jeffrey Davis, had to intervene in at least one incident when Watts came to her workplace and became physical with her. Davis said that Watts would often show up and grab Keita by the arm and try to force her outside. After witnessing many arguments and altercations between the two for years, he had to file a restraining order against Watts to keep him from showing up at Keita's job. Watts often followed her and threatened her as well. On June 25, 2014, she ran errands with her mother and planned to go home and rest with a headache before picking up her children from daycare. Watts asked her to meet him to get some money for their child before going to the daycare, despite her parents' concern about her meeting him alone. Sadly, she never made it to the daycare and was reported missing the next day. Her cell phone was turned off at 4 p.m. after she sent a text message to her fiancé saying that she loved him. When she didn't arrive to pick up the children, her fiancé picked them up and began trying to figure out where she was because it was very unlike her. Her family became very concerned and immediately believed that Watts may have had something to do with her disappearance, but hoped that she would show up safe. The day after she disappeared, her phone was turned back on and pinged in cities all over South Florida. A week after her disappearance, her gold 2007 Nissan Altima was found abandoned at Northwest 40th Street and 10th Avenue in the Liberty City neighborhood of Miami. Initially, Watts told police that he did see Keita the afternoon she disappeared. However, police knew that wasn't true because they already had evidence that proved that at the time, Keita was out running errands with her mother. When confronted with that information, Watts switched up his story and said that he had never met up with her. Phone records show that Watts traveled to Liberty City the day that Keita went missing and the area where her car was later found. Watts has a criminal history for crimes including kidnapping and sex offenses. Authorities wanted to question him, but were unable to locate him for some time after Keita's disappearance. He did eventually resurface when he turned himself into law enforcement in July to face charges for violating the conditions of his supervised release on a federal weapons violation. The violation came from his arrest the same month Keita disappeared when he was charged with battery and false imprisonment after trying to force a teenage girl into his car while she waited at a bus stop. He is an ex-convict with three prior arrests for kidnapping as well as other offenses and has served two terms in prison. Watts pleaded guilty to battery in August 2014 and the judge called him a predator and sentenced him to 11 months in prison. Keita is not the only woman that has been involved with Watts that has either gone missing or been murdered. In April 2022, Watts was arrested for second-degree murder in the death of his wife, Shondell Harris. He stabbed her multiple times for wanting a divorce, and she filed charges against him. He then confronted her at a public pool where children were taking swimming lessons. He had cash and offered her money to drop the charges, with her mother and her 12-year-old daughter both present. When she said no, Watts opened fire on Shondell and killed her in front of her daughter, family, and a lot of children and parents who were watching their kids learn to swim at the Michael Ann Russell Jewish Community Center. He is awaiting trial in Shondell's murder as of April 2022. She is not the first partner of his to be murdered. Vicki Simmons was found murdered in 2009. Her body was found under a bed in a Biscayne Boulevard hotel, and her case is now being re-examined by police also. She was dating Watts at the time of her death and had apparently tried to break up with him. Since his charge of murdering his wife, the investigation into Keita's disappearance and Vicki's murder is now focused on Watts as the suspect. 
Keita's parents stated that if Watts had been behind bars for Vicky's murder, his daughter may still be alive. Also, if he was behind bars for the disappearance of Keita, Shondell may still be alive. But as of April 2022, no charges have been filed against anyone in Vicky's murder or in Keita's disappearance, and these two cases remain unsolved. Catherine Corzilius was born in 1989 to parents Nancy and Paul and lived in Elder Circle near Austin, Texas. She was the six-year-old daughter of Paul Corzilius, the tour manager and family friend of John Bon Jovi. On August 7, 1996, she and her mother and brother Chris went to town to buy a birthday present for their father. Catherine always enjoyed getting the mail out of the mailbox and asked her mom if she could walk the shortcut home while her mom drove through the neighborhood. When she didn't arrive within a few minutes, her mother sent her brother to look for her. He returned and said he couldn't find her, and so her mom went looking for her and found her unconscious in the road. Where she was found was on the other side of the circular drive, away from the home and mailboxes, not on the path where she would have walked home from the mailbox, but on the path that her mother drove home. It was determined that she would not have been able to walk at all following her injuries. It was believed she was the victim of either an attempted kidnapping or a hit and run. She had a fractured skull and other injuries on her body. She was put on a ventilator, but was brain dead, and would sadly die at the hospital. The medical examiner determined that her injuries were not consistent with the hit-and-run theory. Due to the abrasions throughout her body, he determined that it would have resulted from either jumping, falling, or being thrown from a moving vehicle. Canine units tracked her scent from the mailboxes to a vacant lot which was on her route before losing the scent. Nancy thinks an unknown kidnapper in his car picked up Catherine in the vacant lot, drove past their home, then threw her out for some reason. But some theorized that Catherine clung to her mother's SUV while her mother drove home before finally falling off, unbeknownst to her mother. This is supported by the medical examiner's conclusion, which found that shoulder wounds were consistent with being thrown off a car. However, a private detective argued this was unthinkable for many reasons, such as the hot weather would have made the exterior of the vehicle too hot to hold on to, and there were very few places where she could have held on to. Also, her dominant thumb was broken at the time and in a splint, which would have made it difficult and also her mother would have most likely seen her in the rearview mirror. Artist John Bon Jovi recorded a song titled August 7, 415, following her death. Sadly, her brother, Christopher Corzilius, later became a cop and was tragically killed in a car wreck in 2020. As of today, the strange occurrence that day still remains a mystery and the case remains unsolved. Kenny Jo Johnson was born in 1972 in Illinois and then lived in Davenport, Iowa. Kenny Jo loved the outdoors and climbing trees. He also suffered from learning disabilities, which teachers and adults in his life did not understand. He also bounced from school to school with behavioral problems. Teachers described him as a hyperactive child who had difficulty focusing in class. Much of this behavior could be attributed to a learning disability that had gone untreated, and he was even once forced to sit in the front row of class wearing a dunce cap. He was an enthusiastic Boy Scout and won multiple medals for his skills and contributions and loved animals. At the age of 14, he and his mother moved to a rural area of New Liberty, Iowa, and his behavioral problems began to improve when his focus was on the farm's horses. But he was suddenly and unexpectedly ordered to attend the Hillcrest Services Program at Central Alternative School's Franklin Center in Dubuque, Iowa, due to these behavior concerns. He had no family in Dubuque and really wanted to stay in New Liberty with his mother, but he reluctantly enrolled and began his short stay on September 22, 1987. He quickly became known among many as a Dennis the Menace type of kid and was not responding well to teachers and struggled to follow directions. Two weeks after entering the program, he had an argument with a teacher and was told to go to the principal's office. Instead, he allegedly ran away from the school for the third time since his enrollment. 
out on his own and in a strange city, it is believed that he likely got taken advantage of while he sought shelter and was possibly lured into a trap he could not get out of. Two days later, on October 10, 1987, a fisherman discovered the body of a teenage boy in the early morning hours, later identified as Kenny Joe, lying on the sandy beach area near a floodgate in Dubuque's isolated Moss Park along the Mississippi River. An autopsy report determined that he had been beaten, strangled, and sexually assaulted. He also had a small amount of alcohol in his system, equivalent to one or two beers. At the time, some Dubuque investigators thought the killer was a local person because the park is neither well known nor easy to stumble upon by accident. Months later, a profiler speculated that the killer was a loner with antisocial tendencies and likely told someone about the murder despite having trouble making friends. After a story about Kenny Joe's unsolved case ran in 1997, 10 years after the murder, someone came forward and claimed that the carpet Kenny Joe was found wrapped up in was carpet that belonged to him and that he disposed of it on the riverbank before the murder occurred. This information led investigators to believe that the killer hadn't brought it with them with intentions of hiding a body. To date, a plea is being made to Governor Kim Reynolds to compare the DNA evidence left at the crime scene to the owner of the carpet or any remaining family members if the owner is either deceased or non-compliant. A petition is at change.org and I will link the website in the description. Despite searching over three decades, investigators still haven't been able to establish a clear picture of where Kenny Joe was in the two days leading up to his death. DNA from the crime scene was later entered into CODIS, but there have been no matches. In 2021, it was announced that detectives were looking into Eugene Lewis as a person of interest. Lewis was living in the Dubuque area during the time frame of the murder, but police did not release any other information as to why he was a person of interest. Lewis himself was murdered in 2002, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. Martha Leanne Green, who was described as responsible, quiet, and sweet, was born in 1970 and lived in White Bluff, Tennessee, and went by her middle name, Leanne. At the age of 17, she worked as a greeter at the local Holiday Inn and was a junior at Dixon County High School. On April 15, 1987, it was rainy and cold outside when her twin brother Lawson picked her up from work in a Monte Carlo with tinted windows that he had borrowed from their cousin. They had borrowed the car to use for their high school prom, which was the next night. Just a half mile away down the road, the car ran out of gas on Highway 46 near Fabric Road in Dixon County about 9 p.m. A family of four returning from church noticed the car's hazard lights on and pulled in behind them to offer help. Leanne said she was scared, and Lawson said she should come with him and the family so they could get gas, but she decided to stay behind. Lawson then left with the family to purchase fuel, leaving Leanne alone in the car. When they returned, just 10 minutes later, Leanne was gone. Her belongings were still in the car, and there was no sign of a struggle at the scene. Teams of searchers from local police to the public combed 10 square miles around the area where she had disappeared. They searched the woods, motels, and interstate rest areas. Citing a lack of leads, police called off the search for Leanne just three days after she disappeared. After she went missing, an inmate by the name of Robert McKinley Richards, who was incarcerated in Florida on rape charges, confessed to her murder. He took investigators to several places where he claimed to have buried her body, but searches of these locations never turned up any evidence. He said he could not remember her exact location, but was adamant that he was the killer. However, he would later recant his initial confession. Richards would later be stabbed to death in prison by his cellmate in 1991 and was never charged in Leanne's case, but he is still considered the primary suspect in her disappearance. On May 18, 2018, employees on a crew working for Dixon Electric System found human skeletal remains in an open cistern on a property in the 200 block of Blackie Road. It was suspected that they could belong to Leanne and were sent to Nashville to be examined. 
However, the remains were those of a man that had been living under a fictitious name of Steve Johnson, and no foul play was suspected. As of April 2022, Leanne has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Shannon Colleen Cheboltz was born July 9, 1970, in Manhattan, Kansas, to Michael and Karen McKeeman. She married Chadwick Cheboltz in 1989, and they had three children, Colton, Cheyenne, and Chadwick, but later divorced. At the age of 45, she was a grandmother employed at Onaga Community Hospital, was living in Blaine, Kansas, and had been in a very tumultuous relationship with Travis Quigley for about eight years. In March 2015, Quigley was charged with several counts of violence against Shannon, including the use of a bullwhip and rubber mallet. Her parents and children tried relentlessly to get her to finally break off the relationship. She did eventually file for a petition for protection against him, claiming that he verbally, mentally, and physically harmed her by hitting, punching, and kicking her. He also allegedly left multiple bruises, cuts, scratches, and even left her with a sprained ankle. But she would withdraw the petition for protection for no given reason. Her daughter Cheyenne then filed for a temporary protection against Quigley on her behalf. Documents show that the court called Shannon to testify and court officials served her with the subpoena at Quigley's house. The assault case was set to go to court at the end of September 2015, but she would tragically be killed two weeks before. On September 6, 2015, Shannon was a passenger in a truck being driven by Quigley. She somehow was pushed or fell out of the truck at Macy Place Drive and Elm Slough Road in rural Wamego, Kansas. When emergency responders arrived, she was lying next to the truck and had suffered a severe head injury and soon died as a result. Quigley was questioned at the scene, but no charges were filed and for unknown reasons, he wasn't questioned again. Her family then filed a wrongful death suit against him and received a settlement from his insurance company split between her children and their attorney. Quigley was arrested in 2021 for a warrant for unknown charges. As of April 2022, this case appears to be an assumed accident by authorities. However, her family begs to differ. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Bailey Simon was born July 31, 2017 to Taj Janique Graham and Devontae Simon and lived in Conway, South Carolina. On September 28, 2020, someone entered their home in the 1600 block of Sugg Street around 7.30 p.m. and tragically shot little three-year-old Bailey and her mother. Her mother was killed instantly, but Bailey was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Sadly, two days later, she would also pass away from her injuries. Prior to her death, Taj Janique was a member of the South Carolina National Guard, serving as a truck driver, and was also working in the nursing field. On top of that, she was raising her daughter, Bailey. Taj Janique was known as a generous young woman and was not known to have any enemies. She graduated high school from the Academy for Technology and Academics and then joined the National Guard in 2015. At the time, she was 23 years old and close to being promoted to sergeant. Bailey's father, Devante, a former member of the National Guard, was behind bars at the time and a motive for the killings remains unknown. He was devastated when the judge would not allow him to attend his daughter's funeral because he was being held without bond. The Conway Police Department has worked alongside investigators in Horry County and Myrtle Beach and have received more than 100 tips about the shooting and have conducted more than 100 interviews. The FBI is also involved in the case, but no arrests have been made, nor have any suspects been publicly announced, and as of April 2022, this case remains unsolved. 